share your favorite superstition that you've heard about uh, birds um, throughout your life. I have a lot that I heard, you know, from my grandparents and uh, friends throughout the years. Um, so I would love to hear some of the ones you have. Maybe there will be ones we talk about today. Uh, maybe they will be new. Um, so we'll stop every once in a while and just have Ripley share a few that are coming in through the chat um, session. Um, so yeah, that'll be great. Um, so birds have been around in popular culture for generations, really since the beginning of time. But there are certain species that get a little bit of a bad rap. Um, and so sometimes they are seen as harbingers of death. They're thought to be able to move in between worlds. Um, and so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about some of the most common superstitions and myths about birds and then talk about a few specific species um, or groups of birds, some of which we work with pretty closely here at Hawk Watch. Um, and then I have like a bonus section of just some really kind of creepy behaving birds uh, in the world. So let's start by just really high level talking about the difference between a myth and a superstition. So a myth is, um, think Greek, Roman, Egyptian gods, right? They're ancient legends or stories, and they're often used to sustain some kind of social order to society versus a superstition, which is a belief in a supernatural influence or practice. So this might be witchcraft, this might be religious influences, and we'll hear a lot about both of those kinds of things as we move on. Um, so there are some birds that are seen as good luck. So this is a, a good time to put some of those in the chat. And when I finish, we'll see if there are any good luck superstitions that I didn't mention. So uh, the first is cardinals. So cardinals generally mean good luck. They're one of my favorite birds to see, so I was happy to see them make the good luck list. Um, but they also can mean that seeing one means that someone that you love that has passed away is coming to visit, which may be a little good or bad luck, depending on how you feel about that person, I suppose. Um, it's long been said that having a bird poop on you is good luck. Um, so keep that in mind as you're walking around and you get pooped on. Uh, statistically, it doesn't happen very often, um, which maybe is why it seems like it's good luck. Um, chirping chickadees mean that good weather is on the way. So this is a black cap chickadee, one that we have here in the Western US um, and see a lot in the springtime. Um, they have a really fun call. A woodpecker, um, that is pecking on a tree in your yard means that a visitor is coming. And interestingly enough, magpies are a little bit of a wild card, but if they are found in groups, it's meant to be good luck. So there's a poem that says, if you see two magpies, that means joy. If you see four or five, it means silver or gold. And if you see, no, see 11 or 12 together, then it means health or wealth. Um, so Ripley, really quick, were there any superstitions that came in through the chat that weren't listed? Uh, yeah, so this one actually isn't for good luck, but Emily says that they heard one superstition that if a bird gets into your house and dies, that a family member will die short shortly thereafter. So maybe not good luck, but it's still very interesting. I've never heard that before. Yeah, there's a there are a few like that. So. Uh, we'll move on to the more common bad luck <laughs> ones, which people tend to associate more with um, Halloween and really more with superstition. Superstition tends to have more of a negative sort of connotation, but doesn't have to. Um, so it's bad luck to kill a sparrow. And the reason for that is they are thought to be the carriers of the souls of the dead. Um, so you don't want to mess with that. Um, I mentioned magpies in the first section of the good luck section, um, but they're also seen as bad luck. In Christianity, magpies were the only birds that did not offer um, consolation or console Jesus while he was on the cross, um, and so they are seen as a bad omen. Uh, Scottish lore says that they even carry a drop of devil's blood in them, um, and the poem that I mentioned previously says that if you see 13 magpies together, then it means the devil is present. 
So that's a, a good one. This one is similar to what uh, Emily shared in the chat and that Ripley just shared with us. So if you have a Robin in your house, it seems uh, to signify death. Um, interestingly enough, again, in Christianity, Robins were thought to have removed the thorns from Jesus, but that didn't save him. And so they became associated with death. Um, it is bad luck if your chicken lays an even number of eggs. So there are lots of antidotes saying that if you go to get eggs that your chickens have laid, if there's an even number that you have to remove one of them. So. A little bit odd. Um, and then, like I said, I wanted to talk about some of the superstitions and myths surrounding certain groups of birds, some of them that we work with, including vultures. Um, so vultures are unique birds, right? They eat dead things. Um, they have a really great sense of smell. They're often known to represent death and rebirth, um, but they're also in some cultures seen as unclean um, because they eat dead things. <laughs> so, um, some of the myths and superstitions around vultures are really interesting. Uh, one, uh, the Eastern culture believes that vultures are sacred because they clean the country um, by feeding on dead things. Uh, there are even festivals that celebrate vultures. Um, it isn't uncommon in parts of the world to have um, sky burials is what they're called, where they put the dead out for um, scavengers to feed on. So they're creating that circle. It's really common in cultures that believe in reincarnation. Um, so they're kind of fun that way. Um, in Christianity, it's a little bit opposite. They're associated with judgment and shame and having a sick spiritual condition. Um, the Celtic culture believes that they carry spirits to the other world. And they were closely associated with Isis in Egyptian mythology. So Isis is the goddess of uh, life and magic. She was the protector of children and women. And so in Egypt, vultures are thought to be protection from evil um, and also to improve women's fertility. Um, <clears throat> a vulture perched on your house mean that, means that death is coming to your home. And there's even a superstition that if you um, smell or snort the um, powdered brains of a vulture, that it will give you a uh, great intuition. Uh, you can imagine as a conservation group that works with raptors, this is problematic. It creates a real threat to um, vulture populations in the wild. Um, any other thoughts that people have about vultures? please share those. Um, I really like vultures. And so <laughs> um, the fact that they're associated with lots of negative things makes me not super happy, but they are lots of fun. And you'll notice there are lots of Halloween decorations around that have vultures in them. Um, the next group that we're gonna talk about are ravens and somewhat crows. So we work tangentially with ravens at Hawkwatch. We are working on a project where we're looking at the relationship between ravens and sage grouse um, at the same time that we're looking at the relationship between eagles, golden eagles and sage grouse. And so we spend a little bit of time working with ravens. Um, ravens are part of the corvid group um, and they are incredibly intelligent birds. Um, they're also a little bit naughty. I like to think that ravens and crows will sometimes use their their intellect for evil because um, they are definitely mischievous creatures, but they are lots of lots of fun to watch and lots of fun to learn about. And there are a lot of cultures that have myths and superstitions around the corvids. Um, so the Celtic saw them as an omen of bloodshed and battle. Uh, the Irish thought that they were called by the war goddesses to eat the corpses of dead soldiers. Um, they are scavengers, so they will eat dead things. So that's probably not too far off. Um, I mean, maybe not the war goddess part, but definitely the eating dead corpses part. Um, in Hindu, they're thought to hold the souls of the damned. And the Swedish thought that they were ghosts of people who had been murdered and not properly buried. Um, 
<clears throat> I thought that was a really interesting thing. So in North America, there are many Native American tribes and cultures that see vultures as tricksters and even sometimes as shapeshifters. Uh, they were also thought to be messengers, and so they were often carrying messages um, from uh, different people in the tribe during times of strife and hardship. Um, so they're incredibly beneficial. And if you look at Native American art, you see lots of representation of ravens and crows. Um, in England, there were a group of six ravens um, who had clipped wings and were put into the Tower of London as a protection for the tower. Um, and it is very firmly believed that if those ravens are lost or fly away, that the crown will fall and Britain along with it. So they have a really important place in British culture. Um, and there's even a, a Danish myth that uh, believes that if a king or a chieftain was killed in battle and its corpse was eaten by ravens, that those ravens would become something called a valravin, uh, which was an animal that would gain knowledge um, human knowledge by eating human hearts. So, um, a little bit gory. I've seen some things popping up in the chat and I can't see them myself. They kind of come and go. Do you want to share those, Ripley? Yeah. Uh, so, Sammy wanted to mention that they saw some good uh, Halloween decor of some lawn flamingos that have been painted but as vultures with bones all around the ground. Nice. Some very spooky Halloween decor. And then Ken wanted to share that there is an indigenous tradition of finding blue feathers on the forest means that a change in your life, good or bad, is going to happen. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I would be excited to see blue feathers as well. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those. I love that. Keep them coming. That always makes these things more fun. Um, and then the last group we'll talk about are owls. Um, we see lots of owl decorations at Halloween. We get lots of requests for presentations and programs. Um, to take owls to schools and community programs during the Halloween season. Um, so I think really owls have a reputation for being spooky because they hunt at night, um, because they have feather tufts that can somewhat resemble devil's horns. And some of them have really piercing cries. If you've ever heard um, a barn owl, uh, it's an incredibly uncomfortable sound. <laughs> it's very loud and piercing. Um, they're often associated with the idea of magic. Um, if you think about Harry Potter, anytime you see a, a wizard, um, there's often an owl associated with it. Owls are thought to be wise um, because they have these really big forward facing eyes. Of all of the birds of prey, they have the most human like feature that way with the forward facing eyes versus eyes that are offset a little bit more. Um, and so I think people tend to associate a little bit more with them. Um, there are a couple of superstitions around owl's eggs. Um, so in England, they believe if you cook an owl's egg to ash, it improves your eyesight. The same is true in India if you eat an owl's egg. Um, one superstition says, um, this is one of my favorites of kind of all time, that if you can get an, see an owl in a tree and you can get it to follow you with its eyes, that if you walk around the tree, it will follow you enough that it will break its own neck. Um, so it's a little <laughs> disturbing and sad. Um, and then, you know, they've long been associated with witchcraft and witches. So Greeks and Romans believed that owls, uh, or that witches could turn into owls and would suck the blood of children. Um, other cultures believe that their hoots were indicators of a witch coming. Um, and so owls have long been associated with magic and with witchcraft and wizardry. Um, that sounded like a Harry Potter ad, um, but they're one of our favorites for sure. Um, and then in the last few minutes that we have, I wanted to just throw some honorable mentions your way. Um, hopefully this these will come up so this is a a, vol, a vulturine guinea fowl um, so these birds hunt in groups and they capture and kill small mammals 
and you can see they have a somewhat vulture looking head without having feathers on its head. Um, and then they have those really interesting red eyes. Um, this is a vampire finch, uh, which is a small bird that drinks blood, but also holds on really tight. Um, and so it's hard to shake them off. Um, they feed primarily on mammals. Um, this little jewel is called the Greater Honey Guide. You can see that it has a really sharp beak. That beak dulls as it ages, but these are parasitic nesters that eat all of the other birds in the nest. So um, they will commonly get into nests of smaller birds like bee eaters, um, and they'll eat all of the young. Uh, this is a hood mockingbird. You can see it eating um, a turtle. These are birds that are found in the Galapagos Islands. They drink blood primarily from seabirds, and they're even known to leave their prey alive so that they can continue to feed on it. Um, <clears throat> these are called a, uh, greater adjutants, and these are birds that weigh 18 pounds and have seven foot wingspans. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. These are garbage eaters. They're known to eat human and um, animal species, and they're similar to the marabou stark uh, stork, so they look very stork-like. This is the big one that I was thinking of. Um, this is the Antarctic giant petrel, weighs 18 pounds, has a, seven has a seven foot wingspan, and these birds stalk and eat penguins in the Antarctic. And last but not least is the Anahinga. If you've ever been to our migration site in Corpus Christi, you will often see these flying around. These are sometimes called snake neck birds, which is pretty obvious from the photo. You can see this really long slender neck and they will slink in the deep water and just barely put their bill above the water as they're hunting. And then they'll grab things and pull it under the water. So they're a little bit of a stocky hunter. Um, so yeah, any questions or other stories that people wanna share? I think we have some time built in for that. I wanted to make sure that we had more time for the interaction Q&A part. Um, I actually had a couple comments to add. I'm, as you know, Nikki, I'm a huge horror fan. Yeah. And so for the owls, I wanted to add that like more recently, there's been like kind of a development in like why people think they're scary. Specifically, if you've ever seen the film from the early 2000s called The Fourth Kind, um, in that movie, it, they're used as like, uh, a way for like aliens to watch us um, specifically. So I think that's like a new way that the owl fear is kind of evolving in, in recent culture. And then, um, yeah, that's cool. I also wanted to bring up, I just learned this in class the other day, is um, the common loon call is oftentimes used in horror movies to create a really eerie, eerie sound. So if you've ever heard the call of a common loon, it's you'll you'll recognize it from pretty much any old horror movie it'll it'll ring a bell oh yeah i love that i love loons i know a lot of people who travel to sort of the midwest just to see the loons in the spring and summer yeah that's really i mean i think again like popular culture has really affected the way that we see certain species of birds like obviously the first slide had the movie poster from the birds the alfred hitchcock film um, and then, you know, Edgar Allan Poe, Shakespeare, all wrote about um, ravens and other corvids especially, but just, you know, keeping them in the popular culture with that negative connotation. Um, so Diane says that sh I find some of these ideas funny, except for the fact that these superstitions are rather dangerous to various bird species. Um, yeah, and that's true, especially with the the vulture and the black market for vulture brains. That was something we started really learning about when uh, we were working with Egyptian vultures. Um, and so that was really disappointing and saddening to hear because they are such important pieces of the ecosystem as far as being that high apex scavenger in the area. Um, Sammy wants to know what the spookiest thing that I've seen working with raptors. Um, I would say really working with raptors 
Um, there are a couple of spooky, <laughs> maybe creepy <laughs> things. Um, sometimes when we're doing nest surveys, things that we find in the nests are a little scary. Um, food that they're eating, um, you know, coming up on a golden eagle nest that's full of snakes is a little <laughs> disturbing <laughs> sometimes. Um, but I think probably the the spookiest is when we're doing owl research. Um, and I think that's just by the nature of owl research when you're in the dark um, and you're trying to be really quiet and still, um, it can be a, a little uncomfortable um, for, for humans, especially who aren't equipped to survive in the dark very well. Um, but it's also a really kind of wonderful time to see things that you wouldn't see otherwise. But I won't lie, like there have been many times when I've been out doing owl research and standing really still and quiet and thinking a mountain lion could <laughs> like walk up to us at any time and we wouldn't even know it so yeah uh brad wanted to add that barn owls have a very frightening call specifically and wanted to share that one time uh when they were with their wife they heard one in kansas and thought a murder was happening in their backyard <laughs> which i believe it it is. I, um, I love that story, Brad. <laughs> um, I, we banded a bunch of barn owls one year and there were, had one box that had like 12 young in it and they were just like jam packed in there. And the sounds coming out of that box were so scary. Um, and so I recorded it and I took it home and I played it for my son. And he said, he was probably like six or seven at the time. And he said, I, I'm pretty sure there's a witch in that box uh, because that's what he associated it with. So yeah, it is a really uncomfortable sound. Yeah, the uh, Brad also shares that the phone app Wild Calls has some great ringtones, including the barn owl. So if you'd like your phone to sound like a bar, barn owl when someone calls you, it's very in, in with the season. <laughs> yes, it is. Even if just for a few days around Halloween might be fun. I think extended into November a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Great. Any other questions or stories that you all want to share? These are great. I love this. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Um my family is all from the, the southeast, and so I had a, a mama who um, had lots of like home remedies for everything and always had a cure for something. Um, but she was the first person that ever told me about um, owl superstitions, and they always believe that if you hear an owl hooting, um, that it means someone was going to die. And so until I started working with birds of prey and understood them a little better, I spent most of my life thinking that that was actually true because why would my grandma lie to me? <laughs> uh, Sammy shares that they heard about a parrot who witnessed their own their owner's murder and would repeat the owner's last words. Oh, that's that very sad. Yeah. Yeah, parrots are super smart too. Yeah. Honestly, they seem kind of spooky in their own right, too. If you've ever heard them repeat anything back to you or seen some of the ways they act, I feel like it's a little eerie. Yeah. Just because oh, they're so smart. They are. And they can have really loud screams, too. Yeah. So it can also be a little unnerving in the dark. <laughs> Especially if it's like your pet, too, wandering through your house at night and the parrot starts talking to you out of the dark. Yeah. Oh. So great. Well, if that is what everybody has, no other questions. Oh, Ken says, uh, bald eagles have plenty of myths and symbolic inter uh, interactions. Do you know mm. of any, Nikki? Yeah, usually bald eagles are more associated um, with uh, tribes that live near water, so a lot of Alaskan tribes and even the lower 48 Native American tribes really view eagles, bald eagles and golden eagles as um, advisors and they're held very reverently. Um, we see bald eagles in 
some of the myths, like old world myths around like Egyptian mythology and Roman mythology, um, they're always thought to be really strong and powerful. And so having the head of an eagle or eagle feathers is thought to be really lucky um, and creates a, a sense of being really powerful. So yeah, bald eagles are are important for sure, symbolically. Um, ben shares that many sailors in maritime tradition believe that seagulls carried the, soul, the souls of dead sailors. Oh, and interesting. As well as albatross and other seabirds. Albatross are good luck. And Diane adds that killing an albatross brings bad luck to the ship. Yeah, I hadn't heard that about gulls, but I definitely heard that about the albatross, that they are associated with um, good luck in some ways, but bad luck if you kill them at sea. Um, they were thought to, um, there's a whole legend around the albatross and carrying souls of dead sailors to land um, and things like that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing those. It makes sense with how far out you can see albatross on the ocean too. It's the only bird that you can see that far out pretty much. Yeah. Especially when they're migrating. Yeah, and they're so big. They're mm -hmm. hard to, to miss. Hard to miss. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. I love that. Thank you for sharing those. I thought, okay, I only have 20 minutes. I can't add too many. So I'm glad that you all shared some of those too, because they were some that I had seen as well. Um, um. <laughs> again, adding to popular culture, changing the way we look at birds, the, the movie, The Lighthouse is more disturbing of a movie if you consider the scene with the seagull. Excellent yes. horror movie for anyone that hasn't seen it. Yes, it's a good one. Yes, the birds, you have to watch the birds. Yeah. Halloween. It's so cheesy, but also just so great. I love the scene where all the ravens or, well, I think in the birds, they're crows. They're all sitting on the playground equipment yeah. and they're just like watching and you're like, ah. <laughs> you know, I've heard quite a few people say that that movie is actually what made them scared of birds for a really long time. And that's actually a really common fear to have to be afraid mm -hmm. of birds. Yeah. Yeah, it's one we get a lot. That's a good point. I think a lot of our fears, founded or unfounded, come from movies. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all so much for taking out some time from your day and spending it with Ripley and I. Um, we're excited to um, continue our Halloween themes and we'll just keep watching scary movies. <laughs> Lots of good ones out there. Yeah. Um, thank Carrie, you. thanks so much. Yeah, oh, thank you thanks, Ken, Ken. for joining us and everybody else for joining us today. I really appreciate oh. it. Yeah. Thanks. And Ben says lots of people are afraid of ducks. And that's true. Ducks are really mean. They are. <laughs> Never visit a duck pond in the spring. That's like my advice to the world. <laughs> thanks so much. Take care. Take care, everybody.